Okay, this is Kathleen narrating the third lecture, part one, Building Narrative, From Character to Actor to Star. We're talking in this particular lecture about building characters, what the shows and the producers and the writers and the actors do to bring the characters to you. We talk about Richard Dyer's concept of signs of a character, which are all those aspects of a character that communicate his or her nature and personality, including appearance, clothing, props, etc. He calls this the code of character construction, or rules that govern what meanings as a character signifies to us and how those meanings are created. One thing that's important to remember is there's three main things that affect the way we view characters. First of all, our understanding of the world, the concept of television itself, and of the genre. Remember that suspension of disbelief. We're, are we willing, as we sit down to watch TV, to get involved in the world? If we're not, it's going to be affected by that. Um, and also the context in which the character appears. What is the show about? Is it interesting to you? Um, do you buy into the storyline and are you interested in it? And the third thing that, that they try to do with signs is affect our personal viewing situation. Where, when, how, and our mood. And you notice in your assignment I ask you to describe to me what your viewing situation is going to be for your show project. The time of day, um, the circumstances where you are when you're watching it are all going to affect how you interpret the show. Remember, you might have had a really bad day. You might be coming from, you know, getting rear-ended or something on the interstate, and that's not fun. So how is the show going to use character signs to help you get caught up in the world and help you forget the rest of the world so that you can focus on the show? These are all things they have to think about. So one of the first things they talk about in the book I think is great. Um, the opening shot of Mad Men, the audience is introduced to Don Draper. So this is before, uh, this is the very, very beginning of the show. And you don't see much, but you get a lot of message from this about his character. His hair is very slicked back and groomed. His face is clean shaven. His clothes are very formal and groomed as well. So it piques our curiosity. And we also get a little bit of sense of the environment that he's in as well. So all of a sudden, even in the very first seconds, they're helping you forget the rest of the world and be drawn into this world using all of these signs. And then you see him a little bit more from the front. Um, again, it helps define his personality. He has a very stern and focused look on his face, and it helps bring us into the world. And then we see these props, the cigarettes and the matches and the scribbles and the, even, you know, the little stains on the, on the napkin. Those all tell us something about him. And um, I also have a clip for you that you can watch after this is over of the opening credit sequence of this show, which is very interesting. And I also have an interview with the directors about how they decided to make the opening shots. Um, it's very interesting stuff about how they draw you into the world. So other things that they work on is typology of character signs. What is the viewer for knowledge? What do you need to know before the show starts? So a narrative image of the program, what's an enticing representation of what the program's characters will be like and how do they set that up? What's the established pro that the established program often uses its uh, credit sequence to rehearse character relationships? So they're going to do this for you. They're going to help draw you into the world. A good example of this is Gilmore Girls, their opening credit sequence, reintroducing you to the characters, reintroducing you to the environment that they're in, which can help you focus in on this world. There's the daughter, there's the mother-daughter relationship, which is obviously very close. You have the environment, which is very homey, very warm colors, very friendly, and it establishes familiarity with the show. So again, you can forget about the rest of your day, and you can focus in on this world. Another thing that they use, obviously, is character names. These are very carefully chosen because they signify the family they belong to, their religion, their ethnicity, their race. So names are very important. There's some good examples in the textbook of shows that use names to give you a sense of the world. Obviously, their appearance is very important. The designers and the writers and the actors work very carefully to maintain the look of their face, their body, their costuming. Um, meaning is overlapping in all of these things. The culture codes that we understand between dress and hairstyle are predominant in a specific culture at a specific time. We know that these kinds of things change over time. The way that we wear makeup and the way that we wear our hair and the way we dress is very specific. If you look at that 70s show, they make very specific choices in the clothing that um, definitely tells you what's going on and what time period we're in. Um, and these codes are specific to television and television genres as well. Farrah Fawcett 
<clears throat> of course, in Charlie's Angels back in the 70s, this was very, very indicative of sexuality and blondness and femininity, even though she was a tough street fighter. <laughs> um, it gives you a sense of the type of character she was compared to the other characters. Then you have somebody like 50 Cent. It's giving a very, very different impression. He's giving a very bold, masculine, sexual um, presence by the, just the way he looks and his tattoos. And then you have somebody like Roseanne. Her physique connotes a woman who excels at mothering, sexually neutral, although she does have the big hoop earrings on, which is a sign that she still likes to have a little bit of flair to her, but she's very, very um, practical in the way that she dresses. Then things like objective correlative. These are things that are related to the character, very specific to them. An object, sometimes an animal, that is associated with a character and conveys something about him or her. So it has a metaphoric meaning as well. Um, definitely the junkyard sequence, if you watch this clip after you watch this lecture, of the opening credits, which reveal the characters and their setting in Sanford and Son. They work in a junkyard and they have kind of a... a a cluttered old life. Then you have Bart Simpson and his skateboard. Definitely gives you the connotation of his recklessness and also his freedom, his sense of constantly striving for freedom and striving for greater heights. So the skateboard is very closely associated with his personality. Obviously dialogue is very important to the characters, how they speak and how they use language, whether it's very formal like in Frasier or whether it's very kind of homespun like in Roseanne. Um, those kinds of writing choices are very important in the way that the characters use them. And then lighting and videography and cinematography, we'll talk about those in detail later on in the semester, but choices are made very carefully, such as the scene in ER. Um, obviously the mood is very, very dramatic. Um, a lot of time in evening drama shows you're going to see this kind of lighting. Shows like The West Wing or CSI are going to have very specific shadowy uh, interesting lighting choices and even the camera angle here along with the lighting gives you a sense of foreboding a sense of um, you know he he's maybe not quite sure of what's going on he's a little confused right now he seems to uh, be searching for the answers you get that just by the fact of this camera angle looking down on him um, then action of course how the characters actually move around is very important and how dialogue is spoken and how a gesture is made and how a smile is smiled these are all signs and again Richard Dreyer defined this and he said the aspects of the voice and body that an actor uses to communicate to us are also considered signs of performance we talk about vocal facial gestural corporeal um, voice face gestures with the hands and then the body all of these things the actors work very very difficult very hard on to get make sure that they are conveying their character. Um, vocal, we talk about volume, pitch, and tim timbre. Volume is definitely a little bit obvious, you know, how loud or how soft they're speaking, but also the pitch, you know, whether they have a high pitch or a low pitch. And the timbre is a little bit more about the quality, the resonance and the vibration that's caused by their voice. If you think of somebody like James Earl Jones, he has a very deep resonant voice. He was the voice of Darth Vader, and it's a very powerful voice. Then you have somebody like the nanny, um, Fran Drescher, who has a very nasally tone. Um, so somewhere in between is where every actor falls and how they use that timbre is going to define something about their character. And then obviously facial and gestural. Francois Del Sarte in the 1800s was a French uh, theater actor and director, and he came up with what we call the Del Sarte system, which was very, very strict as to how you hold your body, what your posture is, how your feet are planted on the floor, what position they're in, what your hands are doing. It even went so far as to make diagrams as to how you should hold your fingers and your hand to connote certain emotions. Obviously, we're not quite this strict today, but when you were playing to large, large theater houses back before film and television, you had to make very specific choices so that people knew exactly what you were doing. And they, they studied these choices and um, they used them for very specific character choices. We're a lot more free today with what we let actors do, um, but there's still you know certain things that actors do to get certain emotions across. Um, the book gives the example of Meg Ryan being a little bit um, wild in her gestures. She doesn't have specific choices, but she uses her body quite wildly. 
And we also talk about stance and the bearing of an actor's body. These examples from the Big Bang Theory are, kind of summarize what we've just been talking about. The posture here of Jim Parsons' character. He's um, very con constrained and rigid, if you know the show. And just by looking at this picture, without any sound, without any movement, you get a sense of that. Same with the other two characters who are a little bit more slothy and, and relaxed. And even the way they move, the way they run, is going to tell something about their character. And they're going to maintain that throughout the show to make it more clear to you. So that's the end of part one lecture. You can watch some of the clips and then come back for part two.